Welcome to Exploration Dreamland, a quiet read aloud of the writings of explorers of the real world and the worlds of imagination. Drop anchor, relax into your comfortable bunk, and drift off to dreamland with us as we read a lightly edited version of The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley published in 1826. The book will be read in order, so if you would like to begin at the beginning, please start with Season 4, Episode 54. A quick content warning. This book contains occasional references to plague, pestilence, death, suicidal thoughts and actions, and in one section, brief descriptions of war and pillaging. We will try to include specific warnings in the episode descriptions, but if you prefer to avoid these topics altogether, we recommend re-listening to our previous seasons or rejoining us for our next book. If you would like to stay in touch between episodes, you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Exploration Dreamland. If you have a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, it would help other listeners find us. You can also hear our episodes on YouTube. If you are listening there, please like our episodes and leave a comment for us. We'd love to hear from you. Now... Take a deep breath in, and as you exhale, relax any tension in your muscles. Close your eyes, snuggle into your sleeping space, and listen to tonight's tale. Chapter 10 I awoke in the morning, just as the higher windows of the lofty houses received the first beams of the rising sun. The birds were chirping, perched on the window sills and deserted thresholds of the doors. I awoke, and my first thought was, Adrian and Clara are dead. I no longer shall be hailed by their good morrow, or pass the long day in their society. I shall never see them more. The ocean has robbed me of them, stolen their hearts of love from their breasts, and given over to corruption what was dearer to me than light, or life, or hope. I was an untaught shepherd boy when Adrian deigned to confer on me his friendship. The best years of my life had been passed with him. All I had possessed of this world's goods, of happiness, knowledge, or virtue, I owed to him. He had, in his person, his intellect, and rare qualities, given a glory to my life which without him it had never known. Beyond all other beings he had taught me that goodness, pure and single, can be an attribute of man. It was a sight for angels to congregate to behold, to view him lead, govern, and solace the last days of the human race. My lovely Clara also was lost to me, she who exhibited those virtues which poets, painters, and sculptors have in their various languages strove to express. Yet, as far as she was concerned, could I lament that she was removed in early youth from the certain advent of misery. Pure she was of soul, and all her intents were holy. But her heart was the throne of love, and the sensibility her lovely countenance expressed was the profit of many woes, not the less deep and drear because she would have forever concealed them. 
These two wondrously endowed beings had been spared from the universal wreck to be my companions during the last year of solitude. I had felt, while they were with me, all their worth. I was conscious that every other sentiment, regret, or passion had by degrees merged into a yearning, clinging affection for them. I had not forgotten the sweet partner of my youth, mother of my children, my adored Idris, but I saw at least a part of her spirit alive again in her brother, and after that by Evelyn's death I had lost what most dearly recalled her to me, I enshrined her memory in Adrian's form and endeavored to confound the two dear ideas. I sound the depths of my heart and try in vain to draw thence the expressions that can typify my love for these remnants of my race. If regret and sorrow came athwart me, as well it might in our solitary and uncertain state, the clear tones of Adrian's voice and his fervent look dissipated the gloom or I was cheered unaware by the mild content and sweet resignation Clara's cloudless brow and deep blue eyes expressed. They were all to me, the sons of my benighted soul, repose in my weariness, slumber in my sleepless woe. Ill, most ill, with disjointed words, bare and weak, have I expressed the feeling with which I clung to them. I would have wound myself like ivy inextricably round them, so that the same blow might destroy us. I would have entered and been a part of them, so that, if the dull substance of my flesh were thought, even now I had accompanied them to their new and incommunicable abode. Never shall I see them more. I am bereft of their dear converse, bereft of sight of them. I am a tree rent by lightning. Never will the bark close over the bared fibers. Never will their quivering life, torn by the winds, receive the opiate of a moment's balm. I am alone in the world but that expression as yet was less pregnant with misery than that Adrian and Clara are dead. The tide of thought and feeling rolls on forever the same, though the banks and shapes around which govern its course and the reflection in the wave vary. Thus the sentiment of immediate loss in some sort decayed while that of utter, irremediable loneliness grew on me with time. Three days I wandered through Ravenna, now thinking only of the beloved beings who slept in the oozy caves of ocean, now looking forward on the dread blank before me, shuddering to make an onward step, writhing at each change that marked the progress of the hours. For three days I wandered to and fro in this melancholy town. I passed whole hours in going from house to house, listening whether I could detect some lurking sign of human existence. Sometimes I rang at a bell. It tinkled through the vaulted rooms, and silence succeeded to the sound. I called myself hopeless, yet still I hoped and still disappointment ushered in the hours, intruding the cold, sharp steel which first pierced me into the aching, festering wound. I fed like a wild beast which seizes its food only when stung by intolerable hunger. I did not change my garb or seek the shelter of a roof during all those days. Burning heats, nervous irritation, a ceaseless but confused flow of thought, sleepless nights and days instinct with a frenzy of agitation possessed me during that time. As the fever of my blood increased, a desire of wandering came upon me. 
I remember that the sun had set on the fifth day after my wreck when, without purpose or aim, I quitted the town of Ravenna. I must have been very ill. Had I been possessed by more or less of delirium, that night had surely been my last, for as I continued to walk on the banks of the Montoni whose upward course I followed, I looked wistfully on the stream, acknowledging to myself that its pellucid waves could medicine my woes for ever, and was unable to account to myself for my tardiness in seeking their shelter from the poisoned arrows of thought that were piercing me through and through. I walked a considerable part of the night, and excessive weariness at length conquered my repugnance to the availing myself of the deserted habitations of my species. The waning moon, which had just risen, showed me a cottage whose neat entrance and trim garden reminded me of my own England. I lifted up the latch of the door and entered. A kitchen first presented itself where, guided by the moonbeams, I found materials for striking a light. Within this was a bedroom. The couch was furnished with sheets of snowy whiteness, the wood piled on the hearth, and an array as for a meal might almost have deceived me into the dear belief that I had here found what I had so long sought. One survivor, a companion for my loneliness, a solace to my despair. I steeled myself against the delusion. The room itself was vacant. It was only prudent, I repeated to myself, to examine the rest of the house. I fancied that I was proof against the expectation, yet my heart beat audibly as I laid my hand on the lock of each door, and it sunk again when I perceived in each the same vacancy. Dark and silent they were as vaults, so I returned to the first chamber, wondering what sightless host had spread the materials for my repast and my repose. I drew a chair to the table and examined what the viands were of which I was to partake. In truth it was a death feast. The bread was blue and moldy, the cheese lay a heap of dust. I did not dare examine the other dishes. A troop of ants passed in a double line across the tablecloth. Every utensil was covered with dust, with cobwebs, and myriads of dead flies. These were objects each and all betokening the fallaciousness of my expectations. Tears rushed into my eyes. Surely this was a wanton display of the power of the destroyer. What had I done that each sensitive nerve was thus to be anatomized? Yet why complain more now than ever? This vacant cottage revealed no new sorrow. The world was empty, mankind was dead. I knew it well. Why quarrel, therefore, with an acknowledged and stale truth? Yet, as I said, I had hoped in the very heart of despair, so that every new impression of the hard-cut reality on my soul brought with it a fresh pang, telling me of the yet unstudied lesson that neither change of place nor time could bring alleviation to my misery, but that, as I now was, I must continue, day after day, month after month, year after year, while I lived. I hardly dared conjecture what space of time that expression implied. It is true I was no longer in the first blush of manhood, neither had I declined far in the veil of years. Men have accounted mine the prime of life. I had just entered my thirty-seventh year. Every limb was as well knit, every articulation as true, as when I had acted the shepherd on the hills of Cumberland. And with these advantages I was to commence the train of solitary life. 
Such were the reflections that ushered in my slumber on that night. The shelter, however, and less disturbed repose which I enjoyed, restored me the following morning to a greater portion of health and strength than I had experienced since my fatal shipwreck. Among the stores I had discovered on searching the cottage the preceding night was a quantity of dried grapes. These refreshed me in the morning as I left my lodging and proceeded towards a town which I discerned at no great distance. As far as I could divine, it must have been Forley. I entered with pleasure its wide and grassy streets. All, it is true, pictured the excess of desolation, yet I loved to find myself in those spots which had been the abode of my fellow creatures. I delighted to traverse street after street, to look up at the tall houses and repeat to myself, once they contained beings similar to myself, I was not always the wretch I am now. The wide square of Forley, the arcade around it, its light and pleasant aspect cheered me. I was pleased with the idea that, if the race should be again peopled, we, the lost race, would, in the relics left behind, present no contemptible exhibition of our powers to the newcomers. I entered one of the palaces and opened the door of a magnificent saloon. I stared, I looked again with renewed wonder. What wild-looking, unkempt, half-naked savage was that before me? The surprise was momentary. I perceived that it was I myself whom I beheld in a large mirror at the end of the hall. No wonder that the lover of the princely Idris should fail to recognize himself in the miserable object there portrayed. My tattered dress was that in which I had crawled half alive from the tempestuous sea. My long and tangled hair hung in elf locks on my brow. My dark eyes, now hollow and wild, gleamed from under them. My cheeks were discolored by the jaundice, which, the effect of misery and neglect, suffused my skin, and were half hid by a beard of many days' growth. Yet why should I not remain thus, I thought? The world is dead and this squalid attire is a fitter morning garb than the foppery of a black suit. And thus, methinks, I should have remained, had not hope, without which I do not believe man could exist, whispered to me that, in such a plight, I should be an object of fear and aversion to the being, preserved I knew not where, but I fondly trusted, at length, to be found by me. Will my readers scorn the vanity that made me attire myself with some care for the sake of this visionary being? Or will they forgive the freaks of a half-crazed imagination? I can easily forgive myself, for hope, however vague, was so dear to me and a sentiment of pleasure of so rare occurrence that I yielded readily to any idea that cherished the one or promised any recurrence of the former to my sorrowing heart. After such occupation, I visited every street, alley, and nook of Forley. These Italian towns presented an appearance of still greater desolation than those of England or France. Plague had appeared here earlier. It had finished its course and achieved its work much sooner than with us. Probably the last summer had found no human being alive in all the track included between the shores of Calabria and the northern Alps. My search was utterly vain, yet I did not despond. Reason, methought, was on my side, and the chances were by no means contemptible that there should exist in some part of Italy a survivor like myself of a wasted, depopulate land. 
As therefore I rambled through the empty town, I formed my plan for future operations. I would continue to journey on towards Rome. After I should have satisfied myself by a narrow search, that I left behind no human being in the towns through which I passed, I would write up in a conspicuous part of each, with white paint, in three languages, that Verney, the last of the race of Englishmen, had taken up his abode in Rome. In pursuance of this scheme, I entered a painter's shop and procured myself the paint. It is strange that so trivial an occupation should have consoled and even enlivened me, but grief renders one childish, despair fantastic. To this simple inscription I merely added the adjuration, Friend, come, I wait for thee. De, vieni, ti aspetto. On the following morning, with something like hope for my companion, I quitted Forley on my way to Rome. Until now, agonizing retrospect and dreary prospects for the future had stung me when awake, and cradled me to my repose. Many times I had delivered myself up to the tyranny of anguish. Many times I resolved a speedy end to my woes, and death by my own hand was a remedy whose practicability was even cheering to me. What could I fear in the other world? If there were a hell, and I were doomed to it, I should come an adept to the sufferance of its tortures. The act were easy, the speedy and certain end of my deplorable tragedy, but now these thoughts faded before the newborn expectation. I went on my way, not as before, feeling each hour, each minute, to be an age instinct with incalculable pain. As I wandered along the plain at the foot of the Apennines, through their valleys and over their bleak summits, my path led me through a country which had been trodden by heroes, visited and admired by thousands. They had, as a tide, receded, leaving me blank and bare in the midst. But why complain? Did I not hope? So I schooled myself even after the enlivening spirit had really deserted me, and thus I was obliged to call up all the fortitude I could command, and that was not much, to prevent a recurrence of that chaotic and intolerable despair that had succeeded to the miserable shipwreck that had consummated every fear and dashed to annihilation every joy. I rose each day with the morning sun, and left my desolate inn. As my feet strayed through the unpeopled country, my thoughts rambled through the universe, and I was least miserable when I could, absorbed in reverie, forget the passage of the hours. Each evening, in spite of weariness, I detested to enter any dwelling, there to take up my nightly abode. I have sat, hour after hour, at the door of the cottage I had selected, unable to lift the latch and meet face to face blank desertion within. Many nights, though autumnal mists were spread around, I passed under an ilex. Many times I have supped on arbutus berries and chestnuts, making a fire on the ground, because wild natural scenery reminded me less acutely of my hopeless state of loneliness. I counted the days and bore with me a peeled willow wand on which, as well as I could remember, I had notched the days that had elapsed since my wreck, and each night I added another unit to the melancholy sum. I had toiled up a hill which led to Spoleto, Around was spread a plain, encircled by the chestnut-covered Apennines. A dark ravine was on one side, spanned by an aqueduct, whose tall arches were rooted in the dell below, 
and attested that man had once deigned to bestow labor and thought here, to adorn and civilize nature. Savage, ungrateful nature, which in wild sport defaced his remains, protruding her easily renewed and fragile growth of wild flowers and parasite plants around his eternal edifices. I sat on a fragment of rock and looked round. The sun had bathed in gold the western atmosphere, and in the east the clouds caught the radiance and budded into transient loveliness. It set on a world that contained me alone for its inhabitant. I took out my wand, I counted the marks. Twenty-five were already traced. Twenty-five days had already elapsed since human voice had gladdened my ears, or human countenance met my gaze. Twenty-five long, weary days, succeeded by dark and lonesome nights, had mingled with foregone years and had become a part of the past, the never-to-be-recalled, a real, undeniable portion of my life, twenty-five long, long days. Why this was not a month? Why talk of days or weeks or months? I must grasp years in my imagination if I would truly picture the future to myself. Three, five, ten, twenty, fifty anniversaries of that fatal epoch might elapse, every year containing twelve months, each of more numerous calculation in a diary than the twenty-five days gone by. Can it be? Will it be? We had been used to look forward to death tremulously, wherefore but because its place was obscure. But more terrible, and far more obscure, was the unveiled course of my lone futurity. I broke my wand, I threw it from me. I needed no recorder of the inch and barleycorn growth of my life, while my unquiet thoughts created other divisions than those ruled over by the planets. And, in looking back on the age that had elapsed since I had been alone, I disdained to give the name of days and hours to the throes of agony which had in truth portioned it out. I hid my face in my hands, the twitter of the young birds going to rest and their rustling among the trees disturbed the still evening air. The crickets chirped, the aziolo cooed at intervals. My thoughts had been of death. These sounds spoke to me of life. I lifted up my eyes, a bat wheeled round, the sun had sunk behind the jagged line of mountains, and the paley crescent moon was visible, silver-white amidst the orange sunset, and accompanied by one bright star, prolonged thus the twilight. A herd of cattle passed along in the dell below, untended towards their watering place. The grass was rustled by a gentle breeze, and the olive woods, Mellowed into soft masses by the moonlight, contrasted their sea-green with the dark chestnut foliage. Yes, this is the earth. There is no change, no ruin, no rent made in her verdurous expanse. She continues to wheel round and round, with alternate night and day, through the sky, though man is not her adorner or inhabitant. Why could I not forget myself like one of those animals and no longer suffer the wild tumult of misery that I endure? Yet, ah, what a deadly breach yawns between their state and mine. Have not they companions? Have not they each their mate, their cherished young, their home which, though unexpressed to us, is, I doubt not, endeared and enriched even in their eyes by the society which kind nature has created for them. It is I only that am alone, I on this little hilltop, gazing on plain and mountain recess, 
on sky and its starry population, listening to every sound of earth and air and murmuring wave. I only cannot express to any companion my many thoughts, nor lay my throbbing head on any loved bosom, nor drink from meeting eyes an intoxicating dew that transcends the fabulous nectar of the gods. Shall I not then complain? Shall I not curse the murderous engine which has mowed down the children of men, my brethren? Shall I not bestow a malediction on every other of nature's offspring which dares live and enjoy while I live and suffer? Ah, no, I will discipline my sorrowing heart to sympathy in your joys. I will be happy because ye are so. Live on, ye innocents, nature's selected darlings. I am not much unlike to you. Nerves, pulse, brain, joint, and flesh, of such am I composed, and ye are organized by the same laws. I have something beyond this, but I will call it a defect, not an endowment, if it leads me to misery, while ye are happy. Just then there emerged from a near copse two goats and a little kid by the mother's side. They began to browse the herbage of the hill. I approached near to them without their perceiving me. I gathered a handful of fresh grass and held it out. The little one nestled close to its mother while she timidly withdrew. The male stepped forward, fixing his eyes on me. I drew near, still holding out my lure, while he, depressing his head, rushed at me with his horns. I was a very fool. I knew it, yet I yielded to my rage. I snatched up a huge fragment of rock. It would have crushed my rash foe. I poised it, aimed it. Then my heart failed me. I hurled it wide of the mark. It rolled, clattering among the bushes, into Dell. My little visitants, all aghast, galloped back into the covert of the wood, while I, my very heart bleeding and torn, rushed down the hill, and by the violence of bodily exertion sought to escape from my miserable self. No, no, I will not live among the wild scenes of nature the enemy of all that lives. I will seek the towns, Rome, the capital of the world, the crown of man's achievements. Among its storied streets, hallowed ruins, and stupendous remains of human exertion, I shall not, as here, find everything forgetful of man, trampling on his memory, defacing his works, Proclaiming from hill to hill and vale to vale, by the torrents freed from the boundaries which he imposed, by the vegetation liberated from the laws which he enforced, by his habitation abandoned to mildew and weeds, that his power is lost, his race annihilated forever. I hailed the Tiber for that was, as it were, an unalienable possession of humanity. I hailed the wild Campania, for every rood had been trod by man, and its savage uncultivation, of no recent date, only proclaimed more distinctly his power, since he had given an honorable name and sacred title to what else would have been a worthless barren track. I entered eternal Rome by the Porta del Popolo and saluted with awe its time-honored space. The wide square, the churches near, the long extent of the Corso, the near eminence of Trinita de Monti, appeared like fairy work. They were so silent, so peaceful, and so very fair. It was evening, and the population of animals which still existed in this mighty city, had gone to rest. There was no sound save the murmur of its many fountains, 
whose soft monotony was harmony to my soul. The knowledge that I was in Rome soothed me, that wondrous city, hardly more illustrious for its heroes and sages than for the power it exercised over the imaginations of men. I went to rest that night, the eternal burning of my heart quenched, my senses tranquil. The next morning I eagerly began my rambles in search of oblivion. I ascended the many terraces of the garden at the Colonna Palace, under whose roof I had been sleeping, and passing out from it at its summit, I found myself on Monte Cavallo. The fountain sparkled in the sun. The obelisk above pierced the clear, dark blue air. The statues on each side, the works, as they are inscribed, of Phidias and Praxiteles, stood in undiminished grandeur, representing Castor and Pollux, who with majestic power tamed the rearing animal at their side. If those illustrious artists had in truth chiseled these forms, how many passing generations had their giant proportions outlived, and now they were viewed by the last of the species they were sculptured to represent and deify. I had shrunk into insignificance in my own eyes as I considered the multitudinous beings these stone demigods had outlived, but this afterthought restored me to dignity in my own conception. The sight of the poetry eternized in these statues took the sting from the thought, arraying it only in poetic ideality. I repeated to myself, I am in Rome. I behold, and as it were, familiarly converse with the wonder of the world, sovereign mistress of the imagination, majestic and eternal survivor of millions of generations of extinct men. I endeavored to quiet the sorrows of my aching heart by even now taking an interest in what, in my youth, I had ardently longed to see. Every part of Rome is replete with relics of ancient times. The meanest streets are strewed with truncated columns, broken capitals, Corinthian and Ionic, and sparkling fragments of granite or porphyry. The walls of the most penurious dwellings enclose a fluted pillar or ponderous stone, which once made part of the palace of the Caesars, and the voice of dead time, in still vibrations, is breathed from these dumb things, animated and glorified as they were by man. I embraced the vast columns of the temple of Jupiter Stator, which survives in the open space that was the forum, and leaning my burning cheek against its cold durability, I tried to lose the sense of present misery and present desertion by recalling to the haunted cell of my brain vivid memories of times gone by. I rejoiced at my success as I figured Camillus, the Gracchi, Cato, and last the heroes of Tacitus, which shine meteors of surpassing brightness during the murky night of the empire. As the verses of Horace and Virgil, or the glowing periods of Cicero, thronged into the opened gates of my mind, I felt myself exalted by long-forgotten enthusiasm. I was delighted to know that I beheld the scene which they beheld, the scene which their wives and mothers and crowds of the unnamed witnessed, while at the same time they honored, applauded, or wept for these matchless specimens of humanity. At length, then, I had found a consolation. I had not vainly sought the storied precincts of Rome, I had discovered a medicine for my many and vital wounds. I sat at the foot of these vast columns. The Colosseum, whose naked ruin is robed by nature in a verdurous and glowing veil, 
lay in the sunlight on my right. Not far off, to the left, was the tower of the capital. Triumphal arches, the falling walls of many temples, strewed the ground at my feet. I strove, I resolved, to force myself to see the plebeian multitude and lofty patrician forms congregated around. And as the diorama of ages passed across my subdued fancy, they were replaced by the modern Roman, the Pope in his white stole, distributing benedictions to the kneeling worshippers, the friar in his cowl, the dark-eyed girl veiled by her mezzera, the noisy, sunburnt rustic leading his herd of buffaloes and oxen to the Campo Vaccino, the romance with which, dipping our pencils in the rainbow hues of sky and transcendent nature, we to a degree gratuitously endow the Italians, replaced the solemn grandeur of antiquity. I remembered the dark monk and floating figures of the Italian, and how my boyish blood had thrilled at the description. I called to mind Corinna ascending the capital to be crowned, and passing from the heroine to the author, reflected how the enchantress spirit of Rome held sovereign sway over the minds of the imaginative, until it rested on me, sole remaining spectator of its wonders. I was long wrapped by such ideas, but the soul wearies of a pauseless flight and, stooping from its wheeling circuits round and round this spot, suddenly it fell ten thousand fathom deep into the abyss of the present, into self-knowledge, into tenfold sadness. I roused myself, I cast off my waking dreams, and I, who just now could almost hear the shouts of the Roman throng, and was hustled by countless multitudes, now beheld the desert ruins of Rome sleeping under its own blue sky. The shadows lay tranquilly on the ground. Sheep were gazing untended on the Palatine, and a buffalo stalked down the sacred way that led to the capital. I was alone in the Forum, alone in Rome, alone in the world. Would not one living man, one companion in my weary solitude, be worth all the glory and remembered power of this time-honored city? Double sorrow, sadness bred in Sumerian caves, robed my soul in a mourning garb. The generations I had conjured up to my fancy contrasted more strongly with the end of all the single point in which, as a pyramid, the mighty fabric of society had ended, while I, on the giddy height, saw vacant space around me. From such vague laments I turned to the contemplation of the minutiae of my situation. So far I had not succeeded in the sole object of my desires, the finding a companion for my desolation. Yet I did not despair. It is true that my inscriptions were set up for the most part in insignificant towns and villages. Yet, even without these memorials, it was possible that the person, who like me should find himself alone in a depopulate land, should, like me, come to Rome. The more slender my expectation was, the more I chose to build on it and to accommodate my actions to this vague possibility. It became necessary, therefore, that for a time I should domesticate myself at Rome. It became necessary that I should look my disaster in the face, not playing the schoolboy's part of obedience without submission, enduring life and yet rebelling against the laws by which I lived. Yet how could I resign myself? Without love, without sympathy, 
without communion with any, how could I meet the morning sun, and with it trace its oft-repeated journey to the evening shades? Why did I continue to live? Why not throw off the weary weight of time, and with my own hand let out the fluttering prisoner from my agonized breast? It was not cowardice that withheld me, for the true fortitude was to endure, and death had a soothing sound accompanying it that would easily entice me to enter its domain. But this I would not do. I had, from the moment I had reasoned on the subject, instituted myself the subject to fate and the servant of necessity, the visible laws of the invisible God. I believed that my obedience was the result of sound reasoning, pure feeling, and an exalted sense of the true excellence and nobility of my nature. Could I have seen in this empty earth, in the seasons and their change, the hand of a blind power only, most willingly would I have placed my head on the sod and closed my eyes on its loveliness forever. But fate had administered life to me, when the plague had already seized on its prey, she had dragged me by the hair from out the strangling waves. By such miracles she had bought me for her own. I admitted her authority and bowed to her decrees. If, after mature consideration, such was my resolve, it was doubly necessary that I should not lose the end of life, the improvement of my faculties, and poison its flow by repinings without end. Yet, how cease to repine, since there was no hand near to extract the barbed spear that had entered my heart of hearts? I stretched out my hand, and it touched none whose sensations were responsive to mine. I was girded, walled in, vaulted over, by sevenfold barriers of loneliness. Occupation alone, if I could deliver myself up to it, would be capable of affording an opiate to my sleepless sense of woe. Having determined to make Rome my abode, at least for some months, I made arrangements for my accommodation. I selected my home. The Colonna Palace was well adapted for my purpose. Its grandeur, its treasure of paintings, its magnificent halls were objects soothing and even exhilarating. I found the granaries of Rome well stored with grain, and particularly with corn, this product requiring less art in its preparation for food, I selected as my principal support. I now found the hardships and lawlessness of my youth turn to account. A man cannot throw off the habits of sixteen years. Since that age it is true I had lived luxuriously, or at least surrounded by all the conveniences civilization afforded. But before that time I had been as uncouth a savage as the wolf-bred founder of old Rome and now, in Rome itself, robber and shepherd propensities, similar to those of its founder, were of advantage to its sole inhabitant. I spent the morning riding and shooting in the Campagna. I passed long hours in the various galleries. I gazed at each statue and lost myself in a reverie before many a fair Madonna or beauteous nymph. I haunted the Vatican and stood surrounded by marble forms of divine beauty. Each stone deity was possessed by sacred gladness and the eternal fruition of love. They looked on me with unsympathizing complacency, and often in wild accents I reproached them for their supreme indifference, for they were human shapes the human form divine was manifest in each fairest limb and lineament. 
The perfect molding brought with it the idea of color and motion. Often, half in bitter mockery, half in self-delusion, I clasped their icy proportions, and, coming between Cupid and his psyche's lips, pressed the unconceiving marble. I endeavored to read. I visited the libraries of Rome. I selected a volume and, choosing some sequestered shady nook on the banks of the Tiber, or opposite the fair temple in the Borghese Gardens, or under the old pyramid of Chestius, I endeavored to conceal me from myself and immerse myself in the subject traced on the pages before me. As if in the same soil you plant nightshade and a myrtle tree, they will each appropriate the mold, moisture, and air administered for the fostering their several properties. So did my grief find sustenance and power of existence and growth in what else had been divine manna to feed radiant meditation. Ah, while I streak this paper with the tale of what my so-named occupations were, while I shape the skeleton of my days, my hand trembles, my heart pants, and my brain refuses to lend expression or phrase or idea by which to image forth the veil of unutterable woe that clothed these bare realities. O oh, worn and beating heart, may I dissect thy fibers and tell how in each unmitigable misery, sadness dire, repinings and despair existed. May I record my many ravings, the wild curses I hurled at torturing nature, and how I have passed days shut out from light and food, from all except the burning hell alive in my own bosom. I was presented, meantime, with one other occupation, the one best fitted to discipline my melancholy thoughts, which strayed backwards over many a ruin and through many a flowery glade, even to the mountain recess from which in early youth I had first emerged. During one of my rambles through the habitations of Rome, I found writing materials on a table in an author's study. Parts of a manuscript lay scattered about. It contained a learned disquisition on the Italian language, one page an unfinished dedication to posterity, for whose profit the writer had sifted and selected the niceties of this harmonious language, to whose everlasting benefit he bequeathed his labors. I also will write a book, I cried, for whom to read, to whom dedicated, and then with silly flourish, what so capricious and childish as despair, I wrote, Dedication to the illustrious dead. Shadows arise, and read your fall. Behold the history of the last man. Yet will not this world be repeopled, and the children of a saved pair of lovers in some to me unknown and unattainable seclusion, wandering to these prodigious relics of the antipestilential race, seek to learn how beings so wondrous in their achievements, with imaginations infinite, and powers godlike had departed from their home to an unknown country. I will write and leave in this most ancient city, this world's sole monument, a record of these things. I will leave a monument of the existence of Verney, the last man. At first I thought only to speak of plague, of death, and last of desertion. But I lingered fondly on my early years and recorded with sacred zeal the virtues of my companions. They have been with me during the fulfillment of my task. I have brought it to an end. I lift my eyes from my paper. Again they are lost to me. 
Again I feel that I am alone. A year has passed since I have been thus occupied. The seasons have made their wonted round and decked this eternal city in a changeful robe of surpassing beauty. A year has passed, and I no longer guess at my state or my prospects. Loneliness is my familiar, sorrow my inseparable companion. I have endeavored to brave the storm. I have endeavored to school myself to fortitude. I have sought to imbue myself with the lessons of wisdom. It will not do. My hair has become nearly gray. My voice, unused now to utter sound, comes strangely on my ears. My person, with its human powers and features, seem to me a monstrous execrescence of nature. How express in human language a woe human being until this hour never knew? How give intelligible expression to a pang none but I could ever understand? None has entered Rome. None will ever come. I smile bitterly at the delusion I have so long nourished, and still more when I reflect that I have exchanged it for another as delusive as false, but to which I now cling with the same fond trust. Winter has come again, and the gardens of Rome have lost their leaves. The sharp air comes over the Campagna, and has driven its brute inhabitants to take up their abode in the many dwellings of the deserted city. Frost has suspended the gushing fountains, and Trevi has stilled her eternal music. I had made a rough calculation, aided by the stars, by which I endeavored to ascertain the first day of the new year. In the old, outworn age, the sovereign pontiff was used to go in solemn pomp and mark the renewal of the year by driving a nail in the gate of the temple of Janus. On that day I ascended St. Peter's and carved on its topmost stone the era 2100, last year of the world. My only companion was a dog, a shaggy fellow, half water and half shepherd's dog, whom I found tending sheep in the Campagna. His master was dead, but nevertheless he continued fulfilling his duties in expectation of his return. If a sheep strayed from the rest, he forced it to return to the flock, and sedulously kept off every intruder. Riding in the Campagna I had come upon his sheep walk, and for some time observed his repetition of lessons learned from man, now useless, though unforgotten. His delight was excessive when he saw me. He sprung up to my knees, he capered round and round, wagging his tail with the short, quick bark of pleasure. He left his fold to follow me, and from that day has never neglected to watch by and attend on me, showing boisterous gratitude whenever I caressed or talked to him. His pattering steps and mine alone were heard when we entered the magnificent extent of nave and aisle of St. Peter's. We ascended the myriad steps together, when on the summit I achieved my design and in rough figures noted the date of the last year. I then turned to gaze on the country, and to take leave of Rome. I had long determined to quit it, and I now formed the plan I would adopt for my future career after I had left this magnificent abode. A solitary being is by instinct a wanderer, and that I would become. A hope of amelioration always attends on change of place, which would even lighten the burden of my life. I had been a fool to remain in Rome all this time. 
Rome noted for malaria, the famous caterer for death. But it was still possible that, could I visit the whole extent of earth, I should find in some part of the wide extent a survivor. Methought the seaside was the most probable retreat to be chosen by such a one. If left alone in an inland district, still they could not continue in the spot where their last hopes had been extinguished. They would journey on, like me, in search of a partner for their solitude, till the watery barrier stopped their further progress. To that water, cause of my woes, perhaps now to be their cure, I would betake myself. Farewell, Italy. Farewell, thou ornament of the world, matchless Rome, the retreat of the solitary one during long months, to civilized life, to the settled home and succession of monotonous days. Farewell. Peril will now be mine, and I hail her as a friend. Death will perpetually cross my path, and I will meet him as a benefactor. Hardship, inclement weather, and dangerous tempests will be my sworn mates. Ye spirits of storm, receive me. Ye powers of destruction, open wide your arms and clasp me for ever. If a kinder power have not decreed another end, so that after long endurance I may reap my reward, and again feel my heart beat near the heart of another like to me. Tiber, the road which is spread by nature's own hand, threading her continent, was at my feet, and many a boat was tethered to the banks. I would with a few books, provisions, and my dog, embark in one of these, and float down the current of the stream into the sea. And then, keeping near land, I would coast the beauteous shores and sunny promontories of the blue Mediterranean, pass Naples, along Calabria, and would dare the twin perils of Scylla and Charybdis, then, with fearless aim, for what had I to lose, skim ocean's surface towards Malta and the further Cyclades. I would avoid Constantinople, the site of whose well-known towers and inlets belonged to another state of existence from my present one. I would coast Asia Minor and Syria, and passing the seven-mouthed Nile, steer northward again, till losing sight of forgotten Carthage and deserted Libya, I should reach the pillars of Hercules. And then, no matter where, the oozy caves and soundless depths of ocean may be my dwelling before I accomplish this long-drawn voyage, or the arrow of disease find my heart as I float singly on the weltering Mediterranean, or, in some place I touch at, I may find what I seek, a companion. Or, if this may not be, to endless time, decrepit and gray-headed, youth already in the grave with those I love, the lone wanderer will still unfurl his sail and clasp the tiller, and, still obeying the breezes of heaven, forever round another and another promontory anchoring in another and another bay, still ploughing seedless ocean, leaving behind the verdant land of native Europe adown the tawny shore of Africa, having weathered the fierce seas of the Cape, I may moor my worn skiff in a creek shaded by spicy groves of the odorous islands of the far Indian Ocean. These are wild dreams. Yet since, now a week ago they came on me, as I stood on the height of St. Peter's, they have ruled my imagination. I have chosen my boat and laid in my scant stores. I have selected a few books, the principal are Homer and Shakespeare, but the libraries of the world are thrown open to me, and in any port I can renew my stock. 
I form no expectation of alteration for the better, but the monotonous present is intolerable to me. Neither hope nor joy are my pilots. Restless despair and fierce desire of change lead me on. I long to grapple with danger, to be excited by fear, to have some task, however slight or voluntary, for each day's fulfillment. I shall witness all the variety of appearance that the elements can assume. I shall read fair augury in the rainbow, menace in the cloud, some lesson or record dear to my heart in everything. Thus around the shores of deserted earth, while the sun is high and the moon waxes or wanes, angels, the spirits of the dead, and the ever-open eye of the Supreme will behold the tiny bark, freighted with Verney, the last man. The End Thank you for joining us for The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. After a short break, we will resume with Theory of Circulation by Respiration by Emma Willard. Please follow, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. Keep in touch with us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube, and recommend us to anyone you know who could use a quiet break or a little help falling asleep. Exploration Dreamland is produced, edited, and hosted by me, Sarah Van Zaley. A big thank you to Project Gutenberg and LibriVox for helping me find many interesting publications. Thanks also to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for providing the theme music for this show. The title of this piece is Kalimba Relaxation Music, if you would like to visit his website to hear it in its entirety. Sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs>